If you were a fan of Japanese media in the early 2000s, you probably heard of Vampire Hunter D. It's the story of how society was destroyed by a horrendous apocalypse. Not once, but twice. Humanity destroyed the world with nuclear war in the year 1999. From the ashes rose a society built by vampires, the creatures of legend who had been waiting in the shadows for their chance to rule the world. 10,000 years later, vampire society is dying too, and our protagonist, a half-human, half-vampire hybrid named D, is traveling the world hunting said vamps. The story originates in a series of novels, more than 50 of them over the course of four decades. Each story arc works like a monster of the week. There are a few overarching running narratives and longer plot lines, but you can jump in at any point and basically understand what's happening. Dee arrives at a new location and comes face to face with a terrible monster or a person in trouble. Typically, there is an element of mystery or a secret involved and often a great chase across terrible locales before a final showdown with the culprit. Something tragic happens, a terrible twist occurs, or an unexpected cost is paid, and then D hits the road once again, leaving the reader to wonder if he left the town behind him in a better or worse place than it had been before. The author, Kikuchi Hideyuki, is ridiculously popular in Japan. He's the face of vampire literature in the country. It's not his only series or his only popular one by far, but it is a huge one, and one that's been translated into countless languages the world over. It's still being published in English, though we're only on volume 29 of the 50 plus novels, and the series never seemed to permeate pop culture here in quite the same way. Around 2001, an animated movie adaptation of one of the books came out in English, and as far as I can tell, sparked the first real flames of interest in Kikuchi's works in the West. His VHD books began receiving publication here in the mid-2000s, and many of his other titles would eventually be translated around that time as well, though none as extensively as VHD. I was in my early teens in the mid-2000s, and I probably came across it in the manga section of my local library. That was a weird time for novels translated from Japanese. Not literature, of course. If you went looking for Murakami or Tanizaki, you'd find them in the genre of literature appropriate for them. But popular culture stuff like vampires and monsters went in the manga section. VHD wasn't the only series there. The Trinity Blood novels came out around that time, and there were yaoi publications like Only the Ring Finger Knows. But novels in the manga section were few and far between back then, and VHD in particular stood out as very different. It is by no means an anime novel. It's not even close to the same genre. It doesn't have the traditions or trappings of a manga or anime novelization. It's a hardcore horror novel and has some very explicit smut, gore, and extremely adult themes and topics. These novels just did not fit next to Orin High School Host Club and Fruits Basket. People come to the manga section looking for manga. If they find novels, they'll look for novels that are similar in style to the manga they read because that's what they came to the section looking for. So even if you are open to reading a novel rather than a comic, you'd have to be a pretty hardcore fan of horror and dark science fiction. And I mean really dark. I was the exact right audience since I spent my childhood years reading Helsing, a very violent vampire series, and Sayuki, a violent manga series that answers the question, what if Journey to the West, but gay? If VHD had been in the section it belonged, in horror, Perhaps it would have sold better. Perhaps not. It's at least sold well enough the series hasn't stopped publication in years and is now being reprinted in an omnibus format. Still in the manga section, though nowadays some bookstores set out a section for light novels alongside manga. And thanks to the movie, there's a generation of Japanese media fans who know Vampire Hunter D, who think highly of the work because of the stellar film, who actually know nothing about D or the novels he came from. I'm here today because those novels are my favorite books of all time. More than that, I think they're some of the best written horror novels of all time. 
And nothing in the West comes close, save for Clive Barker's incredible, violent, homoerotic fever dreams, like Weave World and Everville. I spent my college years hunting down VHD books like they were rare Pokemon cards, and I probably paid at least a few hundred dollars, collecting not just VHD, but every physically printed Kikuchi book in English. I'm still missing three things, but once I have them, I will definitely have the world record for Kikuchi books owned in English by an obsessive weirdo. I finished my VHD collection just around the time they announced the reprints, so I assume we have me to thank for that. The universe could not ignore how funny it would be for me to spend hundreds of dollars on rare books just to find they were all being made available again. Thanks, God! Now I've finally read all of them, and there's no words for the masterpiece of fiction that is VHD. I've fallen in love all over again, and it's more incredible than I remembered it being as a kid. Because now I understand much more of the history, the literature, and the stylization at work in the background. How Kikuchi blends together an incredible amount of detail and world building to create something so truly unique. Come with me and enter the brilliant, nightmarish world of Vampire Hunter D. The first Vampire Hunter D book opens with a young man riding a horse in the middle of nowhere. He comes across a young woman standing in the road, challenging anyone who passes to trial by combat. The writer tries to ignore her, and the woman demands he fight her. Then, to distract him, the woman rips off her cloak to reveal she's absolutely naked underneath. This is a horror novel from Japan in the 80s. This is pretty typical. She attempts to fight the man and is defeated, overcome by his strength and incredible beauty. Having seen his face, she falls under his spell. More importantly, the man has passed her test. She asks if he's a vampire hunter and if she can hire him. The woman is Doris, a young farmer taking care of her younger brother on her own, and she's recently been bitten by the local vampire lord. The young man on horseback introduces himself as Dee and accepts the job to protect Doris. He's rather impressed with the woman. Typically, victims of vampire bites in this universe become soulless slaves of the one who bit them. It takes a lot of strength and willpower to keep your own mind after being bitten. The Vampire Lord, unfortunately, isn't the only trouble Doris is facing. The villagers have become suspicious since she started wearing scarves all the time. The mayor's son, Greco, a bully and an idiot, has been trying to coerce Doris into marrying him. Learning she's been bitten, he tries to use that knowledge to blackmail her into accepting his proposal. When night falls, the other threat appears. The Vampire Count Magnus Lee, and his followers, including his daughter, Larmaca. Lee wants Doris to be his new bride and won't take no for an answer. His daughter, however, feels differently, horrified at the idea of a human woman dirtying the noble bloodline of her family. To get rid of Dee and ensure he's able to capture his bride, Magnus Lee hires a group called the Fiend Corps, bandits with monstrous powers led by Ray Ginsei. The bandit leader takes a shine to Doris himself, attempting to force his interest at various points in the novel. The story becomes a web of unholy desire, at the center of which is a young teenage girl, desperately fighting for her freedom and her sense of self. As her employee, Dee acts to defend Doris, her brother Dan, and the farm they live on. His work should probably only involve fighting the vampire. He's a vampire hunter, after all but he constantly surprises the humans around him by becoming involved in other problems. He stands up against Greco and the mayor when they attempt to blackmail Doris. He defends her land and her brother, and goes out of his way to be kind to the young boy. Though he is a Damphir, a half-human, half-vampire hybrid, he treats Doris with more kindness and humanity than the actual humans she lives with. Over the course of a few days, Dee and the forces of Magnus Lee face off. People are bitten and turned, battles are fought, dangers are faced. Dee is defeated and almost killed a handful of times, only to rise again, to the shock and awe of friend and foe alike. As they work together, 
Doris and Dee grow close, and the woman offers him both her blood and her body willingly, and Dee refuses to take either. In a final face-off in Lee's castle, the Count Magnus Lee comes to a terrible realization. In his castle, he keeps a portrait of the most powerful, the most beloved vampire of all, the Sacred Ancestor. Vampire society recognizes the Sacred Ancestor as the oldest and greatest of their kind, a godlike being who created vampire society in its infancy. As Dee arrives to face Lee, the Vampire Count recognizes how similar Dee looks to the Sacred Ancestor, and he remembers rumors the Ancestor had been with a human woman, and there had been a child. Dee defeats the Count, setting Doris free. He leaves the castle, never returning to the farm to speak to Doris or her brother again. They watch the vampire's castle crumble from a distance, relieved to know they are safe, devastated to know they'll never see Dee again. And so ends the first novel of Vampire Hunter Dee. The vampire as a concept is a metaphor for sexual violence. The gothic writers in the 17, 18, 1900s weren't able to publish explicit content, but the metaphor was clear to the reading public. A man sneaks into a woman's bedroom in the dead of night, forces himself upon her. The menfolk, her brothers and father, find her in the morning and are enraged, out for vengeance. From Varney the Vampire to Carmilla to Dracula, the themes are the same, and the underlying thread of sexuality, consent, fear of the foreigner, and fear of change are omnipresent. Many of Kikuchi's novels center on the concept of power and consent, on what is freely given and what is forcibly taken. What creates monstrousness? Is it a creature that drinks blood, offered as a gift, or a human being who takes pleasure by force? The dark, twisted worlds of Kikuchi's other novels, Wicked City and Yashikiden, are modern dystopians full of nihilism, sex, and drugs, and they contain countless portrayals of explicit content and assault. However, that style of writing wouldn't really work in VHD. Kikuchi seems to have realized that early on. While the first three VHD novels have a lot of explicit content in them, none of the other volumes do. That doesn't mean Kikuchi doesn't touch on these themes, he just doesn't show the scenes explicitly. Because the gothic element of these novels, that style that conceals violence behind metaphors, just doesn't fit with explicit content. Nearly every VHD novel is about someone fighting a figure of power who wants to take something from them. Sometimes it's a treasured object or a person's life. More often, it's their very body, their blood, their identity. To be turned into a vampire is to be forcibly changed. To have your personality overwritten by your master's desires. The power dynamics involved, in which the vampires are the upper class figures in control of society, and the humans are lower class and impoverished, turns a gothic metaphor for sexual violence into an overall exploration of how damaging feudal society is to everyone involved. When humanity blew up the world in 1999, the vampires had full knowledge it was coming, bunkered down to wait it out, and then returned to the world to rebuild society. The few surviving humans became the lower class, subservient to their vampiric overlords in every way imaginable. At its height, this society was centered around the capital. It's an enormous city, a modern marvel with all the incredible futuristic inventions you could imagine, and it's the heart of a nearly global empire. The vampires have long since built highways across the entire planet. They've created a city on the moon and sent missions into space. At the same time, they've played around with biology, creating or innovating on all the monsters from our bedtime stories. Werewolves, dragons, krakens, all kinds of nightmare creatures are real in this world, left to roam free at the vampires' whims. Outside the capital is the Frontier, a Wild West-style place that likely contains most of Asia, Europe, and Upper Africa. It is divided into sectors ruled by the vampire lords, who control the human populace below them, in much the way a medieval lord controlled his fiefdom. 
The humans are allowed to live on the land vampires own. In return, they must provide a certain crop of blood to their overlords every season. These humans live in squalor and are completely at the mercy of any vampire who may torture, kidnap, enslave, and kill any human they like with little recompense. These vampires aren't typically called vampires. They're called nobles or the nobility. There are greater and lesser nobles based on bloodlines and whether they were born a vampire or made one. And all of them live in the style you would imagine for a noble in an 18th century setting. The houses are enormous and palatial, the clothes are high class. Even the language emphasizes the wealth of difference between the human classes and the vampire upper class. Over time, as the vampire culture weakened due to civil war and invasions and general stagnation, control of society began to switch over to humans. How much switched and when is a little vague. It generally seems like humanity took over through a peace treaty about a hundred or so years before the events of the first book. Since then, most of the trappings of feudal society have remained the same, though the central government is ruled by a kind of liberation army styled in some ways after the Japanese governments of the past. People still live in the dangerous frontier and they can't move without consent from the government. They still have to deliver crops to the capital as part of their trade. They still live with the threat of monsters and vampires in the most remote areas, and poverty and starvation are still very much a problem outside the capital. People from the capital are inevitably depicted as rich and out of touch compared to their down-to-earth poor frontier cousins. The stories and settings of VHD are very much Western-inspired. Growing up, Kikuchi fell in love with the American Western, and the DNA of those films can definitely be found in VHD. Some of the plot lines are nearly repeated beat for beat in his stories, adapted to a gothic and vampiric setting, but similar in setup and execution. The town's D visits are described like their Western towns. People live knowing they carry their lives in their hands. There's little law and order. Might makes right. Innocent people are eaten or gunned down on a near daily basis. But while this general sense of danger and lawlessness is very fitting for a Wild West setting, it's not exactly a one-to-one. -one. The existence of a strong central government exerting so much pressure on the outer provinces is very unlike the American Western. Rather than America, it's actually better to look at Japan's past to understand the government and world building of VHD. For almost a thousand years, Japan has been ruled by military governments, starting with the end of the Heian period in the late 1100s to the early modern period and World War II. While these governments have been pretty different and had varying degrees of stability and success, there are a lot of core similarities between them. Power was centralized in a great capital city, which moved from time to time, but was typically Kyoto, Nara, or Edo. In the capital, the emperor and his upper-class nobility lived in splendor. Outside the capital in the provinces, the people lived in rural poverty, overseen by governors or overlords who drew a certain amount of tax from the people. The nobility would slowly lose power and become figureheads, while the military came to hold real control. As that shift happened, the people lost more of their freedoms, and society became strictly, rigidly defined by class. Your class determined what jobs you could have, what clothes you could wear, even what food you could eat. The world was still divided between the capital city, where the powerful lived in splendor, and the countryside, where the daimyo, the samurai leaders, ruled with iron fists. Farmers paid taxes in rice, and the samurai class were paid their salaries in rice, which meant that the samurai lived off the food given to them by the lower classes. The land the farmers worked on didn't belong to them either. They were renting from the government, living in terrible poverty and giving a huge portion of the entire country's food supply to a tiny part of the population, who had so much rice and so little money, many of the poorest samurai started selling it to merchants, who then sold it back to the populace at a profit. The samurai were at the top of the food chain in this incredibly strict world. They were the nobles depicted as being so above the lower class, so enlightened and so much better, they were not even permitted to see the entertainment of the lower classes because it was beneath them. 
That didn't stop many samurai from sneaking into local theaters to watch lower class plays anyway. Meanwhile, the lower class were restricted from seeing upper class theater because it might depict a better quality of living than they were used to, and no one wanted those poors to get any ideas. Only the samurai were allowed certain weapons, particularly the set of two swords they were known for. With those weapons, they were free to act as violently as they wished. They could cut a man down on the street and claimed he'd been disrespectful and thus deserving of death. They could assault a woman and leave her to die and never suffer a single penalty. They were the elite. The rest of the world was meant to serve them. The more you read about Japanese history, the more you see the almost one-to-one -one parallels between the classes of feudal Japan, the layout of the country, and the world-building of Vampire Hunter D. A powerful central capital city where all the rich live, rural frontier countryside ruled by domineering overlords, peasants forced to feed the parasitic upper class while suffering the most degrading violent treatment at their hands, sexual and physical violence gone unchecked and unchallenged, rigid standards of class in an archaic, crumbling feudal society. It's all there. Kikuchi Hidayuki's vampire is not a Wild West figure or even a gothic one. His vampire is a samurai, living off the food the lower class provides while holding themselves as lofty, morally superior to the naturally inferior beings born to serve them. Everything about vampire culture in these works draws from samurai tradition, the idea of lesser and greater vampires is similar to how samurai tracked their own bloodlines to various noble houses, the veneration vampires give to their sacred ancestor, the ancient all-powerful vampire progenitor, who is definitely Dracula, is similar to the veneration and respect samurai gave the emperor. While feudal societies the world over have a lot in common, the Japanese feudal society of the 1600s was pretty uniquely brutal. The closing off of the country, cutting off Japan from the outside world, restricted how much change and influence could come from foreign ideas, leaving society to stagnate for centuries. VHD's world is also a world of decay and stagnation. The vampires created a feudal society and tried their best to freeze it in time, to travel back to the past they pined for. The vampires are creatures of nostalgia. They don't design their futuristic inventions to look futuristic. No one's driving cars in this world. Instead, they ride cybernetic horses or mechanical carriages. Their homes are not mansions, but medieval castles, completely mechanized with modern cameras and laser weapons, but within the trappings of the Gothic world. The Japanese government attempted to freeze the world with strict class rules and a closed border, the vampires attempt to do it by rebuilding the world in the gothic image, trapping the humans in a world of danger and violence. Both societies failed, and in VHD the reason for that failure is a major question of the series. Taking the outlines of feudal Japanese culture, clothing it in a Wild West setting with gothic vampires as the samurai nobles, Vampire Hunter D sets the stage for one of the best most vivid and heartbreaking metaphors for dynamics of power I've ever read. Like I said earlier, the vampire is all about metaphors of coercion, of assault. In a story like Dracula, where the vampire is a foreign nobleman moving into England to seek an English bride, the power metaphors are clear. He is upper class, and he's also European, a former nobleman, and the idea that foreignness can invade and threaten the morals of the existing power structures of society is an ancient fear of the upper classes. It's in a lot of vampire fiction. But Vampire Hunter D takes that narrative and adjusts it to a world in which the power dynamics mirror a real feudal society. All the vampires are rich and powerful. They are nobility. They are the reason for humanity's suffering and degradation, and people love them. They desire them, they crave to be one of them. They hunger for their touch, their attention, their love. While many vampire narratives touch upon the dual elements of fear and lust in the vampire, few do so with the absolute mastery of VHD. This series is the best metaphor for the way that power and wealth corrupts, and how people are both repulsed by and drawn to the very people who oppress them. How even the most well-meaning good-intentioned of the upper classes 
is so far removed from the experiences of those below them, they may as well be from different worlds, incapable of understanding one another or finding any means of peace. And it is done in a way that isn't a boring morality tale or economics dissertation. In fact, it makes the story incredibly compelling by creating a nobility that has no choice but to be what it is. The vampire is born to drink blood, after all. There is tragedy in their very nature. Many of VHD's stories ask if the human and vampire are even capable of living together, of understanding each other, when their natures are so at odds. This becomes even more complex when other elements of horror and science fiction become involved. A major element of Kikuchi's world building is a 2,000 year long war between the vampires and the OSB, the outer space beings, who function as something like a mimic or Lovecraftian creature, a danger to both human and vampire. Presented with something that could destroy their whole world, the humans and vampires find themselves on the same side of a conflict. By recognizing how truly alien the OSB are, both sides realize how similar they actually are to one another. Kikuchi Hideyuki is a huge fan of Hammer horror films. Most of Japan is, in fact. They were dubbed and brought over to the country during the post-war period and really took off becoming for many the first experience of Western monsters they had. The novels were being translated and released in this time too, but for most Japanese people, their first Dracula was probably Christopher Lee, not Bram Stoker. Kikuchi writes about being terrified of Lee's role, but also becoming fascinated by it, and eventually developing many of his own characters and vampires inspired by the man's performance. It's no mistake that the first vampire lord in the VHD series is Count Magnus Lee. The vampire as we think of it today is a very Western Christian idea. The veneration given to blood isn't very common in every culture. Japan, according to Kikuchi's own writing, has no such respect for it. Christianity, whose traditions venerate the blood of the covenant, the blood of Christ, have long given the substance a sacred position. If you want to explore the idea of the vampire in a global sense, many writers and researchers tend to simplify the concept. It's a nocturnal creature, it's undead or non-living, and it lives off a human liquid. The liquid, depending on the culture, has been everything from blood to breast milk. But Japan doesn't have any monsters that fit that specific mold. When you consider the content of the stories themselves, the closest Japanese model to the gothic vampire is probably the fox spirit, the feminine demon who tempts human men into sexual relations and feeds off their essence. It's not undead and it doesn't drink blood, but the themes and story beats are pretty similar to western vampire stories. Considering all of that, Japan's introduction to the modern vampire in its own culture is pretty unique. Some of the earliest Japanese vampire manga stories are comedies, taking the piss out of characters like Dracula. The other genre vampires moved into first was not horror or science fiction, it was shoujo manga. Shoujo is girls manga, following the general trend of assigning genres of fiction to age groups and genders. Shoujo is a manga style that has very beautiful, often feminine characters, often but not always in a romance or a comedy. Sailor Moon is probably the most well-known of the genre in the West, but decades ago, one of the earliest and most successful shoujo manga was a vampire story called The Poe Clan. The Poe Clan is credited as one of the manga series that successfully propelled the shoujo genre into the mainstream, earning respect and admiration for its writing and art style from greats in the field. The story is centered on beauty and tragedy. These vampires are very much in the Lestat and Anne Rice camp. Not only is the story more a personal drama than it is a horror story, it also contains male-on-male -male romance, which is not uncommon in shoujo. As far as I can tell in my limited experience researching Japanese media and vampires in particular, the Poe clan seems to be the first popular native vampire work, and it's a homoerotic shoujo manga about very pretty sad men. I think it must have had an influence on Kikuchi, if only indirectly since the theme of his works pull on some very similar ideas. Many of the vampires in Kikuchi's fiction are described as unearthly beautiful, often in an effeminate style, 
long hair, delicate faces, that mirrors shoujo traditions. They also have an almost drug-like effect on those who see them, a trend I've only seen in one other genre of Japanese fiction, boys' love. It's not uncommon for a male character in a BL story to be described as so beautiful and attractive he is literally intoxicating to those around him. Kikuchi takes both ideas, the vampiric feminine beauty and the intoxicating lure, and folds it into the world building of VHD in a fascinating way. The vampire has a natural allure humans cannot fight. This draw or pull can only be overcome by a person with a strong sense of self or dignity. They have to have strong willpower. In fact, the word will is used in every book, dozens of times. Conflicts between main characters are at times fought out solely through willpower, through a staring contest or a battle of auras. The vampire's draw is very much tied to their beauty. That beauty, however, is rarely described specifically. It's the existence of beauty, the prime ideal of it. Vampires by their nature, no matter their appearance, are the concept of attraction made real. That beauty has a kind of magnetic draw that the weaker humans and monsters cannot fight. This is seen most with our main character, Vampire Hunter D. D is a half-human, half-vampire, but that doesn't distort his vampiric abilities. On the contrary, he's constantly described as not only the most powerful, but the most beautiful beyond compare of any human or vampire he meets. No one can rival his attractiveness. He draws enemies and allies to him. Men and women fall over themselves for him. Multiple characters, vampires, humans, and others of all genders canonically fall in love with him. Kikuchi tells a story of how early in his career, when they were first working on the first VHD novel, his vision of the character of D changed. The reason was the artist the publisher brought on to do the cover and inside art, none other than Amano Yoshitaka, the incredible artist behind so many of Final Fantasy's beloved characters. His editor told Kikuchi that it was important to let Amano create a very, very pretty D for the cover of the book. It was guaranteed to sell to young women if they did. Kikuchi agreed, the book sold bucket loads with women, and the future of the series was guaranteed. From there, I think Kikuchi went whole hog into the beautiful vampire ideal. Most vampire stories include beautiful people almost accidentally. Vampires just tend to look great. Something about sucking blood gives them an extra glow. While some stories create in-universe explanations for why that is so, none of them go so far or focus so much on beauty as a form of power and potential as VHD. I started trying to count the number of times D is described as beautiful or is complimented in the novels of VHD, and at some point I gave up. It's time to stop! Each novel has at least 30 instances of someone calling D so incredibly handsome, so beautiful, so intoxicating, they'd stab their mother to be with him. Characters become obsessed with D. There are rivals who must fight with him because they are drawn to him like a moth to the flame. There are women who must follow him because they don't know what they'd be without him. There are men and women both who fight and die for him because of a single look at his beautiful face. And D, all this time, has almost no romantic feelings for anyone. The closest he comes is the very first VHD book, and the character of Doris, the girl who ripped all her clothes off when she first met him. They have some tension and chemistry that won't exist in later novels, likely because Kikuchi refined the character of D in the story he wanted to tell. It gives the novels an interesting tragic element. The love interest was met and left behind in book one, and is only ever mentioned one more time in the whole series. So you have this gothic, sci-fi western world, with a government and power structure built to mirror the samurai of feudal Japan. At the same time, you have vampires whose beauty is literally hypnotizing, none more so than our half-vampire protagonist, D. The blend of real-world history and politics, with the more dramatic, tragic elements of homoerotic shoujo, creates a world in which the greatest and most tragic power is attraction. That power none of us can fully influence or control, and one that's heavily connected to political and social power. Most of the characters in VHD are being abused by systems of power. The vampires are literally corrupt government officials. They feed off the people, demanding tribute, taking children. 
Doris in the first novel is trying to escape Magnus Lee, who demands she become his bride. In the second novel, it's Lena, the young ward of the corrupt and abusive mayor who seeks Dee's help. The third novel has a young woman eloping with her vampire lover, while her father is attempting to hunt her down and kill the vampire she willingly chose to be with. These young women live in a world in which the powerful can do whatever they want with them. Kidnap, assault, beat, and abuse them, and nothing can be done. The laws of their world permit it. It's not just women, either. The novel Bedeviled Stagecoach centers on a similar narrative around a vampire lord and his willing male victim, who eventually loses his mind and becomes unable to live as a victim anymore. Then along comes D, beautiful, ethereal D. Wherever he goes, he is looked down on and ostracized. He is a vampire, after all. The main character is presented with a world in which their hero, beautiful beyond compare, is considered undesirable, while their abuser is the one accepted by the state of the world. Dee's beauty, however, does not downplay his dangerous side. People die around him constantly, and it's not always because of his enemies. The man has a moral code, but he does not hesitate to cut others down, human or not. He has no patience for those who draw weapons on him, and his mercy really only extends to children. The truth is, Dee is probably as dangerous as the threats these characters face. Many of the novel's protagonists suffer and die because they join Dee, yet these people never regret it. In fact, many are delighted they were able to spend what was left of their lives with Dee. What makes him different from other vampires, from the nobles he fights? Why is one desired and one loathed? Power is attractive. The entire subgenre of romance that involves rich millionaires and billionaires is proof there's a market for attraction to power. Hell, the entire industry of fame is proof of that. We are attracted to power, even when it's incredibly obvious how dangerous and unsafe it is. In the world of D, the vampires are desired and hated in equal measure, and their beauty, the power they have over other people, is a perfect metaphor for how power in general, whether it relates to money, influence, physical strength, etc., draws people in even when it's against their best interest. That's why D is also a threat and a danger. He is powerful and beautiful and not safe. Using the metaphor of darkness, of those innate deeper desires we all have for what's not safe for us, for the dangerous side of the world, VHD explores the part of humankind that wants to stare into the abyss and see it stare back. D represents the small good side of that risk, the high power can give you when used for your benefit, to protect you, to do good in the world. The vampires and corrupt figures of power in VHD represent the much larger, worse side. All those people who let power go to their head and end up being used by it as much as they use it to hurt others. There are countless characters in D who go mad from power, who lose control and are destroyed, or destroy others from their inability to recognize how far they've gone. That madness is presented in very obvious metaphors to real-world fame and glamour. Vampires throw incredible parties with fountains full of blood. They have balls and dances until dawn. They have beautiful castles and gardens where they chase captured humans for sport. The vampire is the perfect metaphor for the way humanity is drawn to power, to want to have it for themselves, to be turned. And wanting that power that comes from being desired by the powerful in sexual or romantic ways. Yet VHD also shows how much damage those kinds of relationships cause. Power imbalances can never lead to happy, healthy lives, and the powerful themselves can never actually live. When there is nothing to struggle and fight for, nothing to live for, being alive is meaningless. The vampires had everything they could ever want. They had nothing to strive for or struggle to create. Unable to accept change or adapt to new circumstances, they slowly faded into the past, becoming relics of a bygone era. Some of the vampires go to sleep and never wake up. Others attempt to continue as they've always done, ruling their little fiefdoms. None of them are able to cling to the past for long. D is also very aware of the danger power brings, because he is incredibly powerful. He can kill with a look, with a flick of a finger. He dares not drink blood from anyone. Though many offer and come close to giving him blood, D rarely accepts it. 
he fights against the urge, because he dares not use his power on others. He knows it can only end in tragedy. Instead, Dee's greatest ability in battle is the ability to drink from himself. It's one of the many things that make him a fascinating character. A figure in a position of power, as someone who is likely the most powerful vampire to ever live, he could become a god among men, a king of the world, and instead he travels as a wanderer with no home, sleeping on the side of the road and in abandoned houses, drinking from supplements and his own blood rather than hurting anyone else. When you live in a world of might makes right, in which survival requires violence, it takes incredible strength of spirit to turn that violence against yourself. It's that self-control that makes him different from other vampires around him, even those who are trying to be good towards humans and change their ways. Too used to indulging in their power and their desires, they have no practice at holding back and usually give in. Every VHD novel centers upon a specific conflict, which is neatly tied up by the end of the arc. Sometimes it's one book, sometimes it's two to four volumes. But once that subtitle changes on the front page, the story's a brand new one. Almost nothing returns for a second showing. Every story has new characters, new locations, new threats, and new themes, which tie into the overall world building, but in a very loose way. So is there an overarching plotline to VHD? Is there a goal or character development of some kind? It's certainly not traditional. The character of Dee rarely says anything. He's incredibly quiet and withdrawn. He makes no friends and keeps everyone at a distance. The one exception is a strange creature who lives in his body, a parasite that exists in his left hand and is known by just that. The parasite left hand has more personality and life in him, often playing the comedic role to Dee's straight man. D is a vampire who has lived for thousands of years. His existence is very different from those around him, because to be powerful is to be isolated, completely alienated from the world around you. It's not a good thing. It's not anything D asked for. He was created by the sacred ancestor as part of an experiment, a terrible attempt to blend human and vampire into a new creature entirely. D is the only success a being even more powerful than vampires who can walk in the daylight, but that hasn't done anything good for the man. He spends his entire life alone, isolated because of the danger he poses to the world around him. It makes him an incredibly unique protagonist. You see bits and pieces of the human beneath the shadows at times. He is kind and gentle with children, often goes out of his way to protect others who he deems deserves it. At other times, he can be callous and heartless by human standards. The man can kill people he was friendly with and can spare an enemy he once fought with. What goes on in his mind is mostly a mystery, but if you read most of the novels, you can see the greater arc to the story. If the vampire is a metaphor for how too much power, physical or economical, makes a person so monstrous they can no longer understand their fellow people, then D and his creator, the sacred ancestor, take that metaphor to a 10. The sacred ancestor is no mere vampire. He is omniscient and omnipresent. He is a god, and D is his demigod son, who wanders a world his father created trying to fix what has been broken. The sacred ancestor, who I'm just gonna call Dracula because that's who he is. Dracula is described in incredible ways in these books. He doesn't have a physical presence. Often he is just a will, a spirit that haunts a place, a memory that's been embedded in the fabric of the world. He can exert his will over humans, vampires, machines of all kinds, and his power is so potent, so intoxicating no one can resist him. Everyone wants him. The way he moves and acts resembles a Lovecraftian dream god more than a vampire, and many of the problems in the novels, the monsters D faces, or the tragedies that unfold, are rooted in actions Dracula took in the ancient or near past. Dracula fell in love with a human woman called Mina the Fair. However, across the novels, it becomes clear he realized their love could never be. By biting Mina, he would be changing her entirely. The nature of vampire-human relationship means they can never be equals. One of the texts says nearly exactly that. 
that Dracula wanted to create a world in which vampires and humans could be together on equal ground, and the only way he saw to do that was to create a blend of both. So he attempts to do so over the course of thousands of years, ending tens of millions of lives in excruciating experiments and nightmarish torture chambers. Around Book 11, the story heavily focuses on this research, and each reveal of the past becomes more and more horrid. D is enraged by these acts. He is traveling the world looking for them, looking for Dracula, the monster who made him and who caused so much suffering in the world. We see very brief glimpses into the bygone era D once lived in during these times. Flashes of Mina the Fair, the beautiful woman in white with long black hair, who appears at times to stand between D and his father, attempting to placate both. D is her son, the only survivor of dozens of babies who were deemed unsuccessful, and it's implied mother and son were parted tragically early. How and why this happened is never really said. Where did Dracula go? Why did D start chasing him? Much of the narrative is left to the reader's imagination, with only these tiny glimpses painting a picture of horrific tragedy and loss. This is where the draw of the novels really comes from, this overarching mystery of what happened in Dee's past, what Dracula is and what he's trying to do, and how the clash between father and son will finally happen. The narrative grows far more layered, and when you zoom out to consider the entire series, you see patterns and combinations that hint at the greater themes and fates of the characters within. It's almost certain to be a tragedy. There's almost no other fate possible for people like D. Yet he continues to struggle and fight on, clinging to that one thing everyone, human or vampire, clings to in darkness. Hope. The people of the frontier live with the hope a better, brighter day is coming. Some of the most tragic, horrifying things happen to these people, yet they still live with a smile. They do everything they can to survive, give it their all, and can only hope for the best. That hope reappears in the darkest moments of VHD. When a character considers himself useless and powerless before the mighty forces opposing them, Dee reminds him weaker humans are relying on him to be strong, to have hope. A sex worker who spent most of her life in a brothel talks about how she doesn't live focusing on how bad things have been. She thinks about how she always lived the way she liked, with no regrets. Characters like these, who don't cling to anger or grudges, who suffer but manage to stand up and move on, are often the sole survivors of VHD books. Life is precious, no matter the kind of life or the length of it, and D is a protector of life. He may not see the world in the same way as humans or ordinary vampires, but he understands the value that living has. Survival is the most important thing in this world, because nothing else can exist if you aren't alive to experience it. There are a lot of VHD books. Each one I read, I put down and thought, that's my new favorite book. And then I read the next one and it happened again, and again. Each and every one is addicting. Each one builds upon the themes and motifs of the previous and raises them to new heights. They are incredible works of fiction, and it's amazing to compare how far Kikuchi has come from his first novel written in 1983 to the most recent translation. It's an absolute marvel. I need more of these books. I need more of this universe. I need them to finally translate the other side series to this world, including the one where apparently it's about a Dampier vampire hunter who's a woman and we never got that one because God hates me? I need every Kikuchi book ever written to be translated now, please and thank you. There is so much going on in VHD. I could talk about it and peel it apart for hours. It's probably too much for one video. There are 29 books, and I'll be honest, I was really overwhelmed trying to condense all my thoughts into this one script. So I'll probably do more videos in the future about these, because I love these books. I love the movies, I want more people to read them and share them, and I want somebody to write some Grey Lancer slash D fanfiction, because if they don't, then I'll have to, and I'm already plenty busy, thank you. 
VHD is the most beautiful, haunting, and horrifying vampire series out there. It's unique and inventive, it's constantly evolving and adapting new ideas, blending modern themes and gothic traditions into something so... perfect. It's the only word I can use to describe it, because Vampire Hunter D is a violent, gothic, vampire, science fiction, horror, dystopia, homoerotic shoujo fever dream, and it was written as if it were made exactly just for me. Thank you, Kikuchi Hideyuki, and the translator of VHD, Kevin Leahy, and the folks who bring these books to us across the globe. And please, please, can you bring more of these books? And the spin-offs? Also, the rest of the Shinjuku series and the manga about that hot spider demon exorcist. We only got two of those books in the US, and France got like seven, which I feel is very unfair.